Thank you, Anna, for that um, very embarrassing introduction. <laughs> um, and thank all of you for taking time out of your day uh, to come here. And what I hope I can do in the next 45 minutes or so is to talk a little bit about personalized medicine. I hope I'll convince you of the utility of this concept of network biology and how we can apply this to cancer treatment. At times, I'll talk in, in generalities. At times, I'll talk rather deeply about the biology, and I'll hopefully go back and forth. So if at any one point you're lost or bored, just sit tight. We'll come back around. Um, but I want to start with a case to try to make this very personal. So this is a case that, that sort of fell into my lap about three and a half months ago. A 53-year-old woman, mother of three, came in and she complained of abdominal fullness. Whenever she tried to eat a meal, she'd get a couple of bites and she felt too full. Um, and it had gotten worse over the last three months. She didn't have any pain. The only thing that was interesting was she said she had traveled to Mexico a couple of years ago and she had hypothyroidism. In the process of working this up, she got a CT scan and this is a normal CT. This is the liver, this is the spleen, and this is the stomach. And you can see in our patient that her stomach is being compressed between her liver and her spleen because of this gigantic mass that sits in her spleen. Now, <clears throat> this mass looked to me and my colleagues like a typical mass that you see when someone has a lot of cysts in their liver, and that's common, when they have a parasitic infection. And so we said to her, nothing to worry about. We see this, you have a parasitic infection, and we're gonna take your spleen out, and you'll be fine, which we did. This is what her spleen looked like. But the shock was, after we sent her home and said, you're fine, go about your business, when the pathologist called us up and said, you know, that spleen has an angiosarcoma in it. Now, angiosarcoma is a relatively rare tumor. And it's a tumor that we really don't know very much about. I'm quoting for you here from our, a relatively recent journal article that after surgery, there's no correlation between survival and anything you do, chemotherapy, radiation, or some combination. The longest duration of therapy, uh, of survival, so far is 16 years in a patient who had their spleen out at age seven. And there's no evidence that chemotherapy or radiation is of any benefit in this. What am I supposed to tell this woman? And when I told her about this devastating news, and hopefully we've cured this by resecting it, she said, how can you not know what causes this tumor? Are my children at risk for this? Will this thing recur in me? Are you sure that for my tumor there's no per benefit from any kind of combination therapy or radiation? And so I think this brings us now to the question of personalized medicine and cancer therapy. What can we do for people based on some unique characteristics of their own tumor? Okay, so what are the questions that she wants to know and that we'd like to address? Well, we'd like to know what's different about cancer cells than normal cells. Why did the blood vessels in her spleen become an angiosarcoma? Why are they listening to signals that say grow and not listening to signals that say stop? <clears throat> How is this information integrated? How do cells understand what's going on around them to make decisions? How does cancer function as a, as a tissue? That is, even if we understand what's wrong with the cancer cell, if you think of that as a house, houses work in cities. How's the rest of the city contribute to what the house is doing? And how can we use this to better predict her prognosis and come up with better ways to treat her? And that, I think, is the personalized part of personalized therapy. Now, we have a lot of high-tech tools to cure cancer, and I'm gonna to try to convince you that many of the tools that you've heard about are great tools, but they haven't delivered on the promise of personalized cancer therapy. Certainly, all the ads you'll read for personalized medicine invariably in the next sentence say, based on your DNA. And the idea is that if we could query the DNA inside the tumor, it would somehow tell us what the answer was, what genes were mutated, would tell us how to treat this patient. And that would be wonderful. There are a couple things that make it hard. You know, we can take a mouse and we can change two or three genes and turn some organ in that mouse into a tumor. The problem is, when we look at mutations in people, we don't find typically one or two mutations. 
we find thousands or tens of thousands, or in lung cancer, hundreds of thousands. Why is that? Well, it's because we've been living the good life. Unlike a mouse that lives in a colony who you suddenly administer something to and turn on some genes, we got these mutations because we drank martinis. We smoked cigarettes. We went out and enjoyed the beautiful sun on the Cape. And all of those things together, plus the rich foods that we eat and the daily exposure to gamma rays, cosmic rays, and carcinogens around us, contribute to these mutations. And so when we take the next step and we get the parts list, we figure out from sequencing all of the genes, what's mutated and what isn't, we don't know which of those are driving the cancer and which ones are just going along for the ride. How can we use that? I don't want to leave you with the idea that cancer genomics is not helpful. It certainly shows mutations in cancer. But it doesn't give the mechanistic insight that we need to tell us how to treat a particular patient's tumor. Okay. Well, maybe you've heard that another approach, in fact, it's an approach that came before cancer genomics, was called gene expression profiling. The idea was that you could take a tumor and you could look at the patterns of RNA expression, the way the genes were being transcribed, and from that, you could figure out how the tumor was operating. The problem is that tumor cells, as I'll convince you, don't work from RNA. They work from proteins. RNA is the precursor to proteins, but it's not the proteins themselves. And so far, RNA expression has failed to predict therapy. I think, and I'll try to convince you, that there's room, there's, there's opportunity for improvement here, but so far this hasn't worked. And, the, and that's, as I said, because really the way proteins are wired is based on proteins. And so now you come to something I love, and that's proteomics. Why don't we look at all the proteins in a cancer cell and try to figure out what's right or wrong with them and how they're all wired together so that they're, they're talking to each other in these protein-based networks. And I got to tell you that so far, despite all of the effort, that hasn't worked either. And there are lots of cool ways we can do it. We can take a tumor out, we can chop it up, we can run it on a very fancy mass spectrometer, we can identify all the proteins, we can try to construct networks, and we can try to look for how these things are wired, and that's a start. But so far, that hasn't worked in isolation either. And the reason, really, is the message that I suspect my colleague Bob Weinberg told you, and this is his famous figure, and that's because what really regulates what tumor cells do are signaling networks. It, signaling networks are what control whether, set, whether those genes change their expression or whether cells proliferate or migrate or divide. And the regulation of biology has to be understood in terms of biomolecular circuits, systems, or networks that we build out of these proteins. Now, I'm going to give you a very biased perspective about what I'm going to call network biology. And network biology to me is not genomics. Doesn't mean genomics isn't important, but it's not genomics. It's not RNA expression, although these are two areas where it's very easy to get a lot of data. And sadly, it's not even my favorite. It's not just proteomics. It's not measuring the proteins in the cell alone. Instead, <clears throat> it's not these things in isolation. It's the way they work together to form a circuit. We should think about cells the same way we think about our computer. They're circuits that are wired together with hard drives and power supplies and inputs and outputs. And it's the integration of all of those signals into the circuit that controls what cells do. Now, if we think about this as biomolecular circuits, then the signaling pathways, the way a cell senses something and sends a message somewhere else, that's the wiring. And if we could measure the wiring that was happening in tumor cells, I think we would have a better idea of how they were wired rightly or wrongly and how we could attack them with cancer. So the problem right now is we can get a lot of this. We can get a lot of sequencing of tumors and a lot of RNA expression and even some proteomics. But we're missing the information that's going to tell us the tumor-specific vulnerability or how to combine drugs together in order to maximize our ability to kill those tumors. We're missing understanding what's active and what isn't active in that tumor. Okay. Well, you know, this is MIT, and I suspect that many of you have backgrounds in engineering or are involved in engineering concerns. How do we optimize that connection between engineering and biology that we're trying to embody here at the Koch Institute. Well, one thing you could do is you could imagine 
an analogy between electronic and biological circuits. In this schematic, for example, this schematic of a circuit, we might think of as being the same kind of wiring that connects biological circuits together, where these, these colored ovals here represent either signals or proteins that are connected together, right, that control the outputs. And what we might ask ourselves with this is, how does the signaling regulate the outputs? Now, if we had a circuit, it would be easy to identify where the inputs were. Where do we put the voltages? Where do we connect the grounds? <clears throat> and we know what the outputs are. It's the thing that comes through the VGA port or something through the speaker. Right? And we can ask ourselves, we could figure out, if we had this circuit, how the inputs were connected to the outputs if we just knew the key nodes to measure, if we could measure the voltages, for example, at key points in the circuit, we would know how the inputs turn into the outputs. Maybe we can do the same thing with signaling measurements, with some sort of metaphorical meter that we use to measure how voltages and currents are distributed in a circuit. We could use something like a, like a probe card, right, a bed of nails tester. We could put our, our biological circuit here, and we could connect it to all these devices, and it would tell us at any one moment how much activity there was in any one of those signaling pathways. And that might help us come up with new therapies. That is, we could figure out what the inputs were, what the key nodes were that controlled whether cancer cells survived or proliferated or migrated to form metastasis. And this is the message that I want to try to leave you with today with some concrete examples of how we're going to try to do this. Okay. Which nodes carry the critical information? How do we measure their activity? That is, how do we measure the current or voltage that's running through these circuits? And how do we use that information to figure out what's, how to make a tumor vulnerable to a particular therapy? That is, can we figure out what the test points are? OK. Well, I got to back up for a minute for those of you that, um, that aren't uh, interested in biology at all and give you sort of a, a, a very simple analogy for how signaling is controlled. And there are many ways, but this is one of the common ways. Signaling, many ways that signaling um, occurs in cells is, is similar to a game that we used to play when I was a child called pass the red ball. We all stood in a circle, we had a ball, we passed it around, somebody blew a whistle, and whoever was stuck holding the ball, that, they were it, right? And then the person was out or whatever, and kept going. Same deal. Signaling circuits do the same thing, except the red ball's a phosphate group. And so in this case, a protein gets targeted by being phosphorylated, and it goes from being inactive to active. And so all we have to do is measure which proteins are phosphorylated and which ones aren't in certain pathways, and we can infer whether there's flow through that pathway or not, whether that pathway is active or not active. And if we knew the key nodes to measure, we could measure the extent to which those nodes were phosphorylated, for example. And we might find, depending on the phosphorylation state of some things, that that might make cells proliferate, but they weren't going to cause a metastasis. Or other things where if they were phosphorylated, not only might proliferate, but they might cause a metastasis. So we could use this to sort of measure information flow through networks. Now, the caveat is how do you go from information flow about a cell to information flow about tumors in patients? Because, for example, with prostate cancer, we want to know not just is there information flow in the prostate, but is that information flow sufficient to cause that tumor to now metastasize, for example, to this patient's rib? And if so, how are we going to treat that tumor in contrast to a tumor that is not going to metastasize? <clears throat> well, really what we'd like to understand is how these different extracellular cues from the tumor environment or from things we could do to a cancer, like radiate it and give chemotherapy, control what the tumor cell does. Will we be able to cause death of the tumor cell? Will we make the tumor cell differentiate into something that's not a tumor cell? And the idea behind this is the same idea that you would think about with any electrical circuit. In an electrical circuit, if we knew the transfer function, we knew what input gave us what output, we would know exactly what input to give to a cancer cell to kill it. The idea is that the relationship between the responses and the, and the inputs must be controlled by some sort of information processing algorithm that reads the signals. So if we could measure enough signals, we could come up with that transfer function and figure out the right input to get the output that we wanted. And so, and again, let me just point out to you that all of the new, hot, sexy, molecular therapies that you hear about 
are targeting these signaling pathways. They're not targeting RNA expression. They're not targeting mutant genes, not yet anyway. They're targeting these signaling pathways. So this is really where we ought to be looking. Okay. Well, the cancer moonshot that Joe Biden announced has about, I think it was 10, eight or 10 recommendations, and two of those I want to talk about today. One is, how do we overcome cancer resistance to therapy? And the other is, how do we develop new cancer technologies? And I'm going to show you how we're going to try to relate these two. Okay. <clears throat> Let's try to overcome resistance to therapy. Let's try to do a better job of killing cancer cells. <clears throat> now, the classic way that we kill cancer cells is by treating them with drugs that damage DNA. Things like adriamycin and cisplatinum and etoposide and camptothecin, all the conventional chemotherapy drugs that we've been using since the 40s and 50s, many of which are still incredibly effective and many of which are still frontline therapy for cancer. And the question that we could ask is, why do these drugs work? What is it about those signaling pathways that make these drugs work and how do we make them work better? Okay. Cancer cells are preferentially killed, after all, it wouldn't work very well if it killed all the cells in our body. It works because it kills cancer cells and not normal cells. So something about that wiring in cancer cells must be different than the wiring in non-cancer cells. And I have to tell you about two kinds of wiring here. I want to talk first about static wiring, rewiring, and then second about dynamic rewiring. What's static rewiring? Static rewiring means it's how the wiring in the tumor cell it came, to, came about that let that tumor cell become a tumor cell. So that pedigree of the miswiring is going to be carried by the tumor cell forever after. For example, it's the gain of oncogenes or the loss of tumor suppressor genes or some of those cancer driver genes that these cancer cells have that makes them cancer cells. And maybe this gives us a unique vulnerability. Okay. Well, I'm going to show you now. We're going to go a little deep for just a few minutes here and talk about how, do we, how is DNA damage signaling integrated into this signaling network to control what cancer cells do, with the caveat that most of the therapies, chemotherapy, radiation, all targets DNA and specifically causes DNA damage. Now, what cells do is they measure the state of that chromatin integrity, and they activate pathways. The names here don't matter. What I'd like you to take away is they activate pathways that stop cells from dividing, and they allow that, and they send a survival message, and they activate stress pathways. And if the cancer cell can fix the damage, it doesn't die. And if it can't fix the damage, it dies. And the reason wh behind why cancer cells become resistant is because they find really clever ways to stop the cell cycle and fix the damage. We've got to do a better job of stopping cancer cells from fixing the damage. And I'm going to show you some examples of how we've been able to identify personal therapies that work on this. And one of the key nodes here is a molecule I think many of you have heard about called P53. P53 is a particularly important tumor suppressor. In ovarian cancer, for example, 100% of patients with ovarian cancer have a mutation in this gene. In colon cancer, only about 50% of patients have a mutation in this gene. But it's this mutation I'm going to show you that gives us a new angle on how to kill cancer cells in a very personal way. And to do this, what we did was a couple different types of measurements. One thing we did was we used that probe card analogy. We measured all the signaling information we could in signaling networks. We also used, and I'm going to show you this first, a very clever approach of getting rid of specific nodes and then looking to see what would happen. That is, we go back to the signaling network and we ask, well, if we could target this or we could target this or we could target that, would that help the cancer cell to survive or not? And then I'll show you some examples of how we can use small molecule screens to try to come up with better combination therapies. So as I said, the first thing that we did was we took cancer cells and we treated them with chemotherapy. And everywhere you see one of these inverted triangles, we measured as many signals as we could possibly measure. And wherever you see one of these blue and, and red snowman appearing things, we measured what the cancer cells were doing. Were they dividing? Were they dying? where they stopped in their cell cycle. We ended up making a lot of measurements, about 3,500 measurements. And from this, we could, make some we could gain some insight into what molecules might be useful. And I'm going to show you an example of that. And the way we did it was we measured all the signals. So when the signal was very high, it's colored red. When it was very low, it's colored blue. We measured the signals. We measured the responses. 
We use some fancy math that my colleagues here at MIT are very good at. And we came up with three findings. First was, and I'll show you this in a few moments, we came up with a new pathway, a pathway nobody was thinking about, that we could use to target cancer. Second thing we did was we found ways that we could take drugs that are already out there, to, to, to combine drugs that are out there to improve the ability to treat cancer. And the third thing was we found ways, and I'm going to start with this one, that depending on how the tumor cell came to be a tumor cell, that's the personalized medicine part, we could figure out how to treat that cancer. Okay. Now, there's been a lot of interest in trying to target those DNA repair pathways. Remember, if we try to kill cancer cells with chemotherapy and we damage DNA, if we prevent the DNA from being repaired, that might be really great. And one of the key targets here has been the idea of targeting two nodes. The names don't matter, but I'll show them to you. Um, they may matter to, to, to those of you that are interested. ATM and CHECK2. So there are drugs out there in clinical trials targeting this and this. And the question is, is that the right thing to do or the wrong thing to do? Because once those drugs are out there, we're going to use those in trials, and they're being used in trials now for all comers. Everybody who has cancer and is going to get chemotherapy would logically, you would think, you would give these drugs to. After all, these are drugs that are going to block DNA repair. Shouldn't you give that with chemotherapy? So we teamed up with my colleague, <clears throat> Mike Heeman, and we used a very clever RNAi approach to knock out specific nodes. And whenever we knocked out a node, we turned the cells green. And so we could ask if we took out one node or another node in those signaling pathways, would that make the green cells where the node was missing more sensitive or less sensitive to chemotherapy? So we'll damage them with chemotherapy. And if knocking out the node makes the cells more sensitive, we'll lose the green cells compared to the non-green ones. And if it makes them resistant, then we'll get more green cells. And if it doesn't do anything, we'll get about the same number of green cells and white cells as we started with. Okay. And we made a great finding. Uh, one of the findings we found was that if the tumor cell didn't have P53, it was missing that, that a mutant in that P53 gene, we could take out either of those two nodes. And if you look at either the light gray or the dark gray bar, these tumor cells are, are being killed, less survival being killed by conventional chemotherapy. If we normalize everything so conventional chemotherapy effects are normalized, we can dramatically sensitize them. Great. This says, let's give these ATM and CHECK2 inhibitors to everybody, except for this experiment. If we did the same thing, but the tumor cells had P53, now if you gave them chemotherapy, the cells became resistant. It was worse than, not get, than, than giving them chemotherapy alone. So there's a subset of patients who should not get inhibitors of this with chemotherapy if they have wild type P53. Now, okay, maybe it's true about cells in a dish. Is it really true in mice? Is it true in real cancer models? So here's a real cancer model, and I'd like you to notice the tumors alone. So these are tumors that don't have P53. And if we treat them with chemotherapy, a commonly used chemotherapy drug, you can see tumors get a little smaller. But if we get rid of either of those two nodes, the tumors respond better to chemotherapy. Do the same thing in tumors that are almost the same, except they have P53. Chemotherapy still gives us some killing. But now, if we get rid of that node, now we make those tumors resistant. <coughs> Excuse me. What if we look at patients, real patients who are out there in the clinic right now, <coughs> who have either mutant P53 or wild type P53, and just genetically, a subset of those have mutations in those nodes. <clears throat> if a patient has mutant P53 and they, and they are missing that node, these guys do great. Okay? In contrast, if they have wild type P53 and they're missing that node, they do terrible, just like the mice, just like the cells in a dish. And so I think what this means, ah, so what if we have a patient like this? They have wild type P53 and mutant, uh, and they're missing that node. These patients are going to do terrible with chemotherapy. Can we do anything to salvage them? Well, this is the result I showed you before. These are the P53 proficient cells. We knock out that node. We give them chemotherapy. They grow instead of dying. But interestingly, if we target yet another node, so we get rid of this node and another node, we can sensitize them again. What does this mean for patients? Well, it means now we can personalize who we give therapies to by measuring the activation state of those networks.
If they have wild type P53 and that node's around, let's treat them with chemotherapy. If they have wild type P53 and they're missing that node, they're going to become resistant to chemotherapy, but we can give them something that will make them sensitive to the chemotherapy again. If, they have, if, they have, if their tumor is missing P53, we know that they're going to be resistant to the therapy, but we can give them a drug that targets that node and that will make them sensitive again. And if their tumor is missing P53 and they're already mutant in that, we can just give them a DNA damaging drug again. So all we need to do is measure the activation state of two proteins, two proteins, to tell what therapy to give patients with. Now, this isn't perfect, and I say that because we know that there's some toxicity issues and efficacy issues with targeting one of those two nodes. And so we thought, <clears throat> instead of going after those two nodes, is there something that is going to be really unique about P53 cancers that would give us a different thing we could target that might work better than targeting this? And what we discovered in the process of looking at signaling was, in fact, there was another pathway besides the one everyone else had recognized that was required for tumor cells to survive chemotherapy. And it went through this molecule, I'm going to call it MK2. And this data suggested that maybe we could target MK2. And that would be really important. Now let me back up a minute and just explain to you what I mean by that. We know that after cell C chemotherapy, typically what they will do is stop dividing. They will turn on that P53 protein. And then that P53 protein will try to stop that, will, will maintain that arrest, and try to keep the cells alive. But if it can, it'll kill them. Tumors that don't have P53 can't die after chemotherapy. And they're also defective in stopping the cell cycle. But they survive anyway. And the reason they survive is because they use this new pathway to stop dividing and repair the damage. And we wondered if that meant if we targeted this pathway in P53 defective tumor cells, whether we could sensitize them again. Now, the beauty of this approach is that tumor cells that have P53 could not care less about this pathway. So that means if we give an inhibitor of this pathway, and we give chemotherapy to a patient, all of their normal cells don't get sensitive to the chemotherapy. We're only sensitizing their tumor cells. Could we make this work? Well, could we target that particular node to enhance the effect of chemotherapy? So we teamed up with Tyler Jax's lab, and we made a very clever mouse, a mouse that gets lung cancer. This is what the cancer in the mouse looks like. But some of the tumors in the mouse had our, our node. They're shown in black. And some of them didn't. And this means in one mouse, we could compare tumors that were otherwise identical. They were either missing or not missing that one node. Now, this is what the tumors look like. And the tumors that have that node, these are the tumors. And the tumors that have that node stain brown here. And the tumors that don't stain white. You can see here's a brown tumor that has that node. Here's a white tumor that doesn't. And I'd like you to notice that before chemotherapy, there are plenty of white tumors and there's some brown tumors. When we give this chemotherapy to these mice who have an intact immune system, the white tumors disappear, but not the brown tumors. That means that in this mouse model, we can sensitize those tumor cells to conventional chemotherapy by simply knocking out that one node. And that node will do nothing to tumor cells that have P53, or to, to normal cells that have P53, because it doesn't sensitize them. OK. What does that mean for personalized medicine? Well, it means now <clears throat> we can do exactly what we did before. If the tumor has P53, our therapy won't work. But I've shown you how we could get rid of this node, and we could give them, uh, uh, if, they had, if, if they were missing P53, and they had that other node, we'll treat them with chemotherapy. If they were missing the node that made them resistant, we'll give them another drug. And now, if, if their tumor is missing P53, but that pathway is on, we can basically block that pathway and sensitize the tumor. If the pathway is off, they'll respond very well to chemotherapy alone. And we have now data in human patients that this seems to be the case, that those patients whose tumors are missing P53 and lacking that specific pathway I showed you are the ones who do the best if you give them chemotherapy. OK. Let's take a step back. Let's talk about maybe we, can do, maybe we can use this personalized medicine concept in a different way. So let me tell you about another patient. It's a 32-year-old female, a mother of two, 
who presents with a two and a half centimeter mass in the right breast on a mammogram. And the mammogram looked pretty surprising for cancer. This patient had a lumpectomy, that is, they excised the mass and an axillary lymph node dissection. And she had something called triple negative breast cancer, triple negative infiltrating ductal breast cancer. And she had eight out of 23 nodes positive. Now, this, this is a disaster for this patient. She already has what, what, what we would call stage 3A breast cancer. It's even more of a disaster. I guess I'm violating HIPAA rules here because this is my cousin. And so now she calls me up, and her dad calls me up, and she says, what am I supposed to do? I said, well, you get conventional chemotherapy. You're going to take Taxol for 12 weeks, and then doxorubicin and Cytoxan for four cycles. And she wants to know, is, this, is my tumor going to recur? Are my kids still going to have a mother? My older cousin calls me and says, is, am I going to have a daughter? What do I tell her? Is this the best treatment for her? After all, this is the treatment that every conventional oncologist is going to tell her she should take. Well, <clears throat> let's talk a minute about dynamic network rewiring. I told you about static rewiring. That's what happens with a tumor because of the way it evolved. I want to talk now about dynamic rewiring. Dynamic rewiring is what happens when you do something to a tumor to try to kill it. Dynamic rewiring is changes that occur in the tumor when you perturb it, like, for example, you give it DNA damaging chemotherapy or you try to uh, ligate the blood vessels that feed it. And these are things that let tumor cells change their state so that they're not killed by anti-cancer treatments. And I want to show you an example of how we can use this dynamic rewiring to improve treatment of cancer. Okay. Now, <clears throat> I got to tell you, if you've heard of, of rewiring or dynamic rewiring, it's usually been in a bad context. This is sort of the poster child for why tumors become resistant to therapy. This poor patient has metastatic melanoma. <clears throat> Turns out that in this disease, there's a mutation that we now know is causal in a large subset of those. It's in a molecule called BRAF. And Plexicon, a company, came out with a great drug. And you can see, after 15 weeks of being on that drug, this guy is cured, cured of melanoma until eight weeks later when it all comes back. Why did it come back? Well, it came back because after they had targeted that, that pathway, the tumor cells rewired and they found a way of, to get around the blockage that the drug caused to turn that pathway back on again, okay? And as a result, network rewiring has a bad context but what, or a bad connotation. But what I want to tell you about is it can really be beneficial for combination chemotherapy if we use molecularly targeted drugs plus DNA damaging cytotoxic drugs. Now, I showed you an example of that Plexicon drug. That's a targeted therapy. And everybody, all the drug companies are really excited about targeted therapies. RAF inhibitors, ALK inhibitors, MEK inhibitors, EGFR inhibitors. They're great. The number of patients who've been cured by those pales in comparison to the number of people who've been cured by plain old-fashioned conventional DNA damaging chemotherapy. This number is about 10,000 times bigger than this number. So why don't we try to combine them in a clever way, and that's what Mike Lee in my lab did. What Mike Lee wanted to do, oh, and I gotta tell you where, the con, where, where this idea came from. So <clears throat> every now and then it helps to, to, to be able to use other parts of your background. You know, in the military, we do something called combined arms warfare. And the idea behind combined arms warfare is something like this. If I've got an enemy and they're hiding inside a building, I'm not going to be very successful if I try to shoot them. That's like a cancer cell, right? I'm not going to get very far if I try to take it out because they're hiding in a building. So you say, aha, well, why don't we just use indirect fire? We'll fire some, some mortars at them and we'll blow up the building. Fine, that's not going to work because they're just going to run away. The idea of combined arms therapy is let's put the cancer cells in a dilemma. Let's use, let's use mortar so they can't stay there, but as soon as they try to leave, we'll use direct fire to kill them. This is exactly the idea I'm going to show you of dynamic rewiring. We're going to put those cancer cells in a dilemma. They can't stay like they are. They have to change. But as soon as they change, we're going to kill them. And that's what Mike Lee did. He asked, if I treat them with one drug, that's like firing in the mortars, and I wait a little bit of time, wait for the them to flee the house, and then I hit him with the second drug, can I kill him? And he tried a bunch of combinations of pathway inhibitors and DNA 
damaging drugs. And he got a super interesting hit. Two drugs, doxorubicin and erlotinib. Now, <clears throat> I gotta tell you, the reason I say it's interesting is because doxorubicin, which is a DNA damaging drug, and erlotinib, which is an EGFR inhibitor, are already approved for triple negative breast cancer. I could write prescriptions for any of you in the clinic today to get these drugs. And in fact, there have been a couple of trials. And what the trial showed was that, you, this is looking at cell death, you get a little bit of tumor cell killing by erlotinib, a little bit with doxorubicin, you mix them together, you get a little more. Not much though. This is, what we, this is something that looks statistically significant, clinically meaningless, okay? But interestingly, if you delve into the trial, although the number of patients who did better wasn't, wasn't really clinically, clinically meaningful, there were a few who were cured. Wow, that's interesting. What's special about them? What Mike found, consistent with that dilemma was, if he just used these same two drugs, but he gave one and he waited before he gave the other, he could increase the ability to, of killing those cells by 500%. Same two drugs. All he's doing is scheduling them different. Okay? If you reverse the order and you gave the DNA damaging drug, the doxorubicin, before you gave the EGFR inhibitor, you made the, you made the doxorubicin less effective. Well, it's unique to triple negative breast cancer. Again, looking at death here. That time staggered thing seems to really kill triple negative breast cancer. It doesn't work, as you can see here, with other types of cancer. There's something special about triple negative breast cancer. I'm going to make a very long story short and tell you that we did the same kind of systems measurement I told you before. We measured as many things as we could, we used some fancy math, and we tried to explain the results. And as a result, we got biomarkers to tell us who were the patients who we should treat. And I'm going to show you how we came up with a nanoparticle way to treat them. Here's the bottom line of what we found. <clears throat> there were a subset of triple negative breast cancer cells that were addicted to signaling through the EGF receptor. So when you gave those, those, those tumors DNA damaging drugs, you could kill them through one death pathway, but another death pathway was blocked. When you took those same tumor cells and now you blocked this EGFR pathway and you waited, you have to wait, they rewire. Just like, the, just like that malignant melanoma cell. You've now chased those tumor cells out of that building, and now you can get them with direct fire. You've reestablished that pathway that was masked, and now the same amount of, of damage by chemotherapy gives you a lot more death. All right, does it really work in a mouse? Here's a mouse with a breast tumor growing in its flank, and this is what happens, the tumor grows this big. We give those mice one dose of the chemotherapeutic drug we treat patients with, the tumor responds a little bit and picks up and keeps growing. If we give them doxorubicin and that EGFR inhibitor to get, get a little bit more death, but the tumor picks up and keeps growing. In this experiment, if we block the EGF receptor, and now we gave them 12 hours later that DNA damaging drug, the tumor did not pick up. And when we chopped this tumor up, we couldn't find evidence of live cells in it. Could we go one? One step further, I'm gonna skip this for the sake of time. Actually, I'll just get to the punchline here. We could come up with biomarkers. The biomarkers turned out to be whether they were signaling through the EGFR pathway and whether that death pathway was available. Could we now make a new drug that would take advantage of this? Because now we have biomarkers of who to try it in inpatients. We teamed up with my wonderful colleague, Paula Hammond, <clears throat> my scientific sister. And we asked, could we come up with a way to make sure the tumor cells saw the EGF receptor inhibitor, and then later, after they rewired, saw the DNA damaging drug. So we came up with a way to incorporate these two drugs in a, in a doxorubicin-encoded liposome. It gave us rapid release of the EGFR inhibitor, slower release of the doxorubicin. And when we tried it in mice, this is what we saw. These are the tumors that grow without any treatment. If we just give them the DNA damaging drug alone, the tumors don't care, they laugh at it. If we give them our particle that, kill, that, that targets the EGF receptor and then waits and then damages DNA, the tumor shrinks. This is triple negative breast cancer. It also works in lung cancer. These are mice that have a non-small cell lung tumor. You can see the tumor grows quite nicely on its own. If you give them a particle that only has the DNA damaging drug, the tumor could not care less. But if you give them a particle that gives them that EGFR inhibitor and waits, 
now gives them the chemotherapeutic drug, you can see we can get a profound response. This is a log scale of the tumor size as a function of time. And I'd like you to notice that only these open circles, which are the combination nanoparticle, is able to do that. Okay. The last seven, oh, and we published this in a terrific journal. So <laughs> I'm the editor. It's a joke. Okay. I, I want to spend the last seven minutes or so telling you about how we can move these drug combinations for cancer treatment closer to the clinic. Now, maybe you've heard that one thing that people are trying to do is instead of using, you know, the problem is when we see a patient in the clinic, is that patient like the mouse model I have or not like the mouse model? And so the new idea has been, well, maybe we could take the patient's tumor and we could grow that tumor in a new mouse and we could treat the mouse. And we could see if the mouse survived or not. And if the mouse survived, well, then we would know that would be the treatment to give to the patient. The mouse would be an avatar for the patient. There are just a couple of problems with that. If I want to test a lot of drugs or drug combinations, I got to use a lot of mice. It takes a while for that tumor to grow in the mice and a while for the tumor to respond to treatment. How do we know the patient's going to live long enough for us to get the results back from the mouse? And finally, Maybe I'll find therapies that, that, that would, maybe we have therapies, but they just don't work because we can't get the drug concentration high enough in the tumor. Maybe I could figure it out if I had a way to do that. And so as part of the Bridge Project, we teamed up with Ali Jonas at the time he was in uh, Bob Langer and Mike Seema's lab and some folks at Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center to focus on advanced prostate cancer and ask if we could come up with a way to test some of these combinations that were inspired by that network medicine approach in real tumors. Now, as I think some of you may know, with prostate cancer, the current idea is that if, it, if the patient has a small tumor that's localized to the prostate and it's not metastatic, maybe we should do nothing or maybe we should do some sort of local therapy but the most common thing we do is we deprive that tumor of androgens because that's what drives, we think, prostate cancer growth. Now, once the tumor's metastatic, right, the cat's out of the bag, we got to try some other stuff and see if it's going to work. And we wanted to know, were there combinations that we should try that might be there in the clinic? And the way to do this, I'll skip this, um, is <clears throat> what Ali came up with was a very clever device. I'll show you more details of this in a moment. A very small device that you could put a lot of different combinations in, and then you could use a needle to implant it in a tumor. I'm going to show it to you in the mouse. And then you could leave it there for a day or two, and then you could use a core needle to pull that tumor and the device back out, and you could look at what happened to, all, to the tumor in response to all the different treatments. Here's the device in more detail. See these little red dots? Those are reservoirs. And we can put about 30 reservoirs in each device, and we can put one drug in or combinations in. And we can simply implant these, see how small the device is, right into a tumor without worrying about the effect of the drugs on the rest of the animal. And then we can take it back out and look at what happened. I'm going to show, and so the first idea was to simply make mice that had metastatic uh, tumors from metastatic cancer that was uh, castrate resistant prostate cancer and try a bunch of drugs or combinations. And then we can try the same thing either with combinations of drugs or giving the mice systemically one agent and looking at what the other agents did in the tumor. Here's an, some examples of that. Wherever you see dark staining here, that's dead cells. So this is a tumor, and where you see the white area here, that's where that round device was. So when we take it out, there's just empty space. And you can see that this is a prostate cancer tumor, and you can see that there's some treatments, for example, erlotinib or trimetinib, that give you a little bit of death. And there are some treatments that don't give you much death. The satinib, doxorubicin, olaparib, not a whole lot. If we took these tumors and we simply combined them with another drug, we gave the mice one drug and now we combine them, look what happens. The amount of death we get from erlotinib or trametinib is tremendous. We get this huge advance. Lapatinib, which doesn't do much on its own, works terrific in this combination. Other treatments, however, do just the opposite. Serafinib's pretty good. If you give it with this other drug, it's less effective. Etoposide's pretty good. You give it with the other drug, it's less effective. And so this device now lets us ask what happens with a whole lot of conventional drugs that are already approved. 
Maybe we can use this to figure out what combinations to give. Based on that systems approach, we actually found some new combinations. This is a prostate cancer, and if we give it the conventional therapy that we give to many, many patients with, with metastatic prostate cancer, a drug called abiraterone, you can see there are a couple of black cells here. We got a little bit of tumor cell death. If we give it another drug, one of my favorite drugs, we get a little death. But if we combine them now, we get really increased synergistic death. And so what this is telling us is we can use these devices now with that systems-based insight that we got from thinking about cancer cells like circuits to come up with new combinations that we can use. What's the future? Well, wouldn't it be great if we can now move this into patients? Maybe we could put this into patients who are about to get radical prostatectomies. And then when we did the prostatectomy, we could look to see what therapy worked, and now we would have a real personalized therapy. Now, to do this, of course, we have to have some idea what drugs to combine. We can't just combine everything. But that's where the systems approach comes in. So the next step, obviously, is trying to move this into patients. And I can tell you that Ollie, Oliver has already been able to get approval for a phase one trial that's doing this currently in breast cancer. And the next thing that he's come up with is a way, is a device that releases agents in a staggered way. So things like our EGFR, doxorubicin combination could actually be tried in a, in a real tumor in a real patient. Now that, to me, is real personalized cancer therapy. It's not therapy in an avatar mice. It's not therapy in cells and culture. Instead, it's therapy in the patient's own tumor. So if you remember nothing else, I hope you'll remember these five points. A network medicine approach to treating cancer is what's going to let us leverage genetics and RNA expression with analysis of signaling pathways in tumors so that we can find the dysfunctional circuits that cause and sustain cancer, and then we can target them. There are two kinds of ways that tumor cells rewire their circuits. Okay? They're rewired in order to become a tumor, and that static rewiring shows us vulnerabilities in the tumor that we can target. That's like that MK2 pathway or that ATM pathway. And if we figure out in a particular person how their circuits are rewired, we know exactly what drugs to give. Dynamic rewiring is a way that we can use this combined arms doctrine of the military to kill cancer cells. We can state stack them. We can force the tumor cells into a state where they're now going to be more responsive to killing by a second drug. And importantly, this seems to work for at least a subset of agents with agents that we already have FDA approved. We don't have to find new targets. We don't have to go out there and write to the FDA to ask permission to, 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 to do this. Maybe we do with nanoparticles. But we have the drugs right now. We might have the answer to cancer right now. We just don't know how to use it right. Network medicine-based approaches can be tested directly in patients using these tumor implantable devices in the future. I can't wait to see what's going to happen in a few years, but clearly this is one way to do it. And then my plea is that progress in network medicine can only continue <clears throat> if we have sustained funding for basic and applied science. If we just fund applied science, we're never going to find those vulnerable nodes. They got, we got those through very basic, basic science. And I would urge all of you when you go out and vote and when you write letters to your congressman to plead with them to increase funding through NIH for cancer to allow us to do not just applied science, <coughs> but the basic science that drives the applied science pipeline. OK. A lot of people contributed to this work. Um, I, I've tried to talk about some of them as we went through it. Uh, their names are shown here. We could not have done this without my colleagues here at MIT. Paula Hammond from Chemical Engineering, Tyler Jacks, who's just been inspirational for me my entire career, Mike Heeman, I showed you some of our early data on that, Oliver Jonas, who's now has his own lab at the Dana Farber, Bob Langer, and Mike Seema, obviously, our clinical colleagues at Harvard Medical School, and funding from the NIH, the DOD, and the Bridge Project. And I just want to stop and say, I, I think I am, in a lot of ways, the luckiest guy around, because these are the people who are currently in my lab. And I really have the honor of being able to stand up here and tell you about all the great work right, that these people are doing. But I have the easy job. They have the hard job standing day to day at the bench, thinking about all the patients with cancer, and what they need to do to try to cure those patients. Thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>